Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. Much of the content that I create here on my channel is educational and I've actually created an entire boards prep series on this channel over a year ago now. And as you may know, I've also collaborated with Archer in the past and I've done multiple other AANP and ANCC reviews. So I've taken back to my material again. I revamped it once more. This time, it's a little different though in my presentation. I will be delivering this course both on YouTube and on Patreon. This second lecture here is all about the endocrine system in regards to your nurse practitioner licensing exam. However, this video is a shortened version. To get total access to this video and the complete audio files for the nurse practitioner licensing exam, then go ahead and follow the link in the description below and that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course will launch on February 27th, 2023, in which you pay a monthly access fee. Please enjoy this free video to help you study and to access, again, those complete audio files, make sure that you become a patron and join my tier called ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, that total course is not fully launched until February 27th, but I wanna make sure and give you guys a sneak peek of the material to come. All right, so without further delay, let's dive into the endocrine system for your nurse practitioner licensing exam. All right, so the endocrine system, this functions as a negative feedback system, meaning if a hormone is low, then our body works extra hard to compensate and to produce more of whatever this hormone may be. And then the opposite is going to be true as well. So if a hormone is high, then our body works overtime to try and stop its production and maintain that homeostasis. And so the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, this is what we recognize that helps maintain the homeostasis of our body's hormones. The hypothalamus stimulates that anterior pituitary gland to produce follicle stimulating hormones, so FSH, luteinizing hormone or LH, and then thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. So FSH, LH, and TSH, they all communicate with whatever their target organ, either the thyroid or the ovaries, to produce their active hormones. So for example, estrogen or the thyroid hormones, which we're going to discuss now. First, we're gonna talk about thyroid disease. So like I mentioned, there is the thyroid stimulating hormone or that TSH, and then those active thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Remember, if you're taking the AANP, they do provide for you those normal labs, but if you're taking the AANC, then you want to know those normal labs before going in. So they are provided for you here. TSH, normal values are from 0.5 to 4.5. T4 or thyroxine, the normal values are 0.8 to 1.8. T3 or triodothyronine, <laughs> Uh, 80 to 220 are the normal values. So important to know the best screening to, uh, tool for both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism is going to be the TSH, that thyroid stimulating hormone. So whenever a patient is being screened for thyroid disease, our first step in practice is going to be to order a TSH. And then what the results are of that TSH help to guide you in whatever your next steps may be. So if the TSH is normal, then no further testing is going to be indicated unless of course they're experiencing symptoms. If TSH is high, you should add a free T4 to help determine the degree of hypothyroidism. If the TSH is low, and then you should add on a free T4 and T3 to determine the degree of hyperthyroidism. All right, so there are two big problems with thyroid disease. There is hypothyroid or too low, hyperthyroid or too high. So first I'm gonna talk about hyperthyroidism with you guys. So the classic lab findings of a patient with hyperthyroidism is decreased TSH, with an elevated T4 and T3. And because remember that stimulating hormone, that TSH doesn't have to work as hard because there is already so much thyroid hormone, that active thyroid hormone already circulating. 
So patients with hyperthyroidism, they often present with symptoms of tremor, palpitations, anxiety, increased heart rate, weight loss, heat intolerance. A good way to remember this is with hyper, everything becomes heightened. The most common cause of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. Up to 80% of patients with hyperthyroidism in fact have Graves' disease. And a way to remember this is to think of the phrase rushing to the grave for hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease, rushing to the grave. So Graves' disease, this is autoimmune. It causes an increase in production and function of both the T3 and T4, those active thyroid hormones. A classic patient with Graves' presents with ophthalmopathy, so eye involvement. We can see upper eyelid retraction, lid lag, swelling, conjunctivitis, bulging eyes. All of that is going to be a high indicator for Graves' disease. And if these are all present, then you can confidently diagnose them with this. However, confirmation of Graves' disease is done with antibody testing. And so we have the thyrotropin receptor antibodies and then the thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Uh, another important diagnostic test to know is that 24-hour radioactive iodine uptake. So iodine, this is an element needed for the production of thyroid hormone. And since our body does not naturally make iodine, it's very important to be included in the diet. So this test involves having the patient ingest radioactive iodine and then measuring the amount of radioactivity in the thyroid gland. And the results of this test will help to determine the cause of hyperthyroidism. Other uh, examples of causes for hyperthyroid besides Graves' disease would be thyroiditis and then other iatrogenic causes. Hyperthyroidism can affect many different organ systems. So we can see it affects skin, eyes, the cardiovascular system, the metabolic, respiratory, and the GI. So it really affects so many different aspects of our patients' lives. And I wanna briefly highlight how hyperthyroidism can specifically affect the cardiovascular system. And this is a really important point. With hyperthyroid comes an increase in that cardiac output. So the arrhythmia atrial fibrillation actually can occur in up to 10 to 20% of patients with hyperthyroidism. Often this arrhythmia, it will self-correct once the thyroid is corrected, though some patients will end up actually requiring a cardio of cardioversion. And I think that this is a really important point. One, because you could see like a question like this on your board's exam. Also two, because if somebody presents with AFib, a, a new onset AFib, it is beneficial to make sure that they are not hyperthyroid. So how do we treat hyperthyroidism? There are three main treatment options for this. We have antithyroid medications, the thionamides, we have radioactive iodine, and then we have surgery. Very important to know, radioactive iodine is contraindicated in pregnancy and both lactation. If patients are having significant signs and symptoms, of hyperthyroidism, or if they're at an increased risk for complications, maybe they have a lot of comorbidities, then it's recommended they begin those thionamides immediately in addition to a beta blocker. And that beta blocker is important and that's to help to maintain the heart rate. And we follow that with radioiodine and surgery. So there's really a lot of treatment involved in those high risk patients. Uh, the thionamide methamazole, this is the most commonly used thionamide or antithyroid drug. Um, but for patients that have severe hyperthyroidism, like I said, ultimately it will come down to surgery. As always, it's so important in practice and for your board's exam that we have red flags and emergencies on our radar. Thyroid storm. This is a very rare but extremely life-threatening condition, and it can occur from untreated hyperthyroidism. It's a result either of thyroid surgery, trauma, or infection. And with this, a good way to remember this is to think of the storm. A storm is high energy, so it's easy to correlate storm hyperthyroidism. Classic symptoms of a thyroid storm include tachycardia, high fevers, 
GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dysfunction of that central nervous system. So we can see our patients uh, with agitation, psychosis. The worst case would be coma. But typically with this thyroid storm, everything becomes severely heightened. Again, those should be easy to correlate. Storm, high energy, hyperthyroidism, thyroid storm. Diagnosis of a thyroid storm is made with the presence of those symptoms, those classic symptoms that we expect with thyroid storm, and then correlating labs. So a low thyroid stimulating hormone, that low TSH, and a high T4 and a high T3. Like I said, this is a life-threatening emergency. These patients, if at all you suspect that they are having a thyroid storm, they are referred to the ER for very close monitoring there. Treatment though in the hospital typically will involve beta blockers, again, to control that heart rate, thiamides, those antithyroid medications, and then glucocorticoids as well. All right, so moving on to hypothyroidism now. So Hajimoto's, this is the most common cause of primary hypothyroidism in settings where iodine deficiency is not of a concern. So like I mentioned previously, we do need iodine to produce thyroid hormone. And our bodies do not make iodine, so therefore it's really important that we ingest it into our diet. In the U.S., this really isn't a concern because we have a lot of food that is fortified with iodine, but in areas specifically Western Pacific, Southeast Asia, and then Africa, iodine deficiency is a real problem and a leading cause for hypothyroidism in those locations. Like I said, though, here in the U.S., Hajimoto's, is the leading cause and this is another autoimmune disease and it's the most common cause of hypothyroidism so what this means is that the individual's immune system is attacking an otherwise healthy thyroid and although autoimmune diseases they can affect anyone this is more common in middle-aged women so symptoms of hypothyroidism can vary greatly amongst patients. There is a classic textbook presentation though, and that's a person with correlating lab values with also fatigue, bradycardia, cold intolerance, weight gain, constipation, and irregular menstrual cycles. And so a good way to remember this is that hypo goes slow. Hypo goes slow, and if you really like to rhyme, then hypo goes slow, hajimoto. The whole thing rhymes, and it can kind of give you a good little memory trick to get those straight. A goiter can also be present in patients, especially if they have an iodine deficiency. We almost always see that, but we can also see it in hajimotos as well. Hajimotos is confirmed with thyroid peroxidase antibodies. These antibodies are almost always ele elevated in patients with Hajimoto's. Also, a thyroid ultrasound can be very beneficial and it, you should definitely get that done if there's any kind of asymmetry or any kind of tenderness on palpation. A confirmed diagnosis though of hypothyroidism, again, is remember those lab values. So, a, so remember if the circulating hormones T4 and T3 are low, so the active hormones are low, our TSH, our thyroid stimulating hormone, is gonna be working extra hard. And so that's a, it's an easy way to remember when you really just think about it. Our circulating hormones are low, so our TSH is working extra hard, and so it's high to make up for that. If a person's initial TSH comes back elevated, then the TSH should be repeated, and we should add on a T4. And doing so will help you to confirm your diagnosis of hypothyroidism. All patients with hypothyroidism, regardless of their symptoms, they should be treated. Fortunately though, for this, treatment is really straightforward. It's easier to remember. What you need to have tucked away in your brain is the drug levothyroxine, and this is synthetic T4. The goal of treatment for these patients is to, of course, normalize that TSH level. And generally, our initial dosing can be started at whatever the intended full dose is. But there is an important caveat to this, and you need to know this for practice and for your board's exam. 
If the patient has established cardiac disease or if they are above 60 years of age, then you should start these patients on a low dose of the levothyroxine. And the studies say between 25 and 50 micrograms daily. And then what you should do is have their TSH remeasured again in four to six weeks after starting them on treatment and see what their levels are at and then titrate as needed.